The economic advantages of the Panama Canal are obvious. Its unique geography facilitates trade with a direct water link between Europe and the Pacific and trims nearly 8,000 miles off the shipping route between New York and San Francisco. The engineering behind this modern marvel is ingenious and the transit of ships a masterpiece of choreography. The route begins on either the Atlantic or Pacific entrance, where vessels make their request to canal traffic control for permission to pass through the locks. The locks are double-sided, permitting traffic to flow in either or both directions at once. Experienced canal pilots board the ships to navigate them through the narrow waterways, helped into the locks themselves by special electric locomotives called mules, which pull the ships into the chambers. Except for the opening and closing of the massive lock doors and the towing of ships into the lock chambers, the entire raising and lowering operation works from gravity. Panama's jungles receive 100 inches of rainfall each year and flush billions of pounds of water from the high regions of the Continental Divide to the Atlantic and Pacific. As the water fills the lock chambers on its way to the sea, ships float on its surface and rise without mechanical assistance. What is mind-boggling about the operation is its overwhelming size, which can best be appreciated when the locks are drained for maintenance. Repair and upkeep is an ongoing demand, with over $100 million spent in the last 10 years on improvements. The difficult handwork is accomplished in largely the same fashion as in 1915. A human touch is required on every square inch of the locks. The lock chambers are massive, their length longer than three regulation football fields. Their volume, the equivalent of nearly 500 school buses. Four space shuttles could be parked within each of the locks. When these giant chambers were first designed, they could easily accommodate three ocean-worthy vessels at a time. Today, shipbuilders base the dimensions of their Panamax cargo ships so that one enormous craft can perfectly match the contours of a lock. Once through the locks, ships enter the man-made Gatun Lake. Formed by the waters of the Chagras River, the lake also contains hundreds of tiny islands with ecological microsystems, which are natural laboratories for valuable research by universities and scientists. But the lake does not extend from one coast to the other. The Culebra Cut, meanders for nine miles through the mountains of the Continental Divide to link the system. Carving this piece of the puzzle was the deadliest part of the canal construction, as unstable hills avalanched into the work area to bury men and equipment. Even today, the most intensive canal maintenance efforts are focused on the treacherous Culebra Cut. Since its original construction, this channel has been widened from 300 to 500 feet to allow passage of wider modern vessels. More earth has been removed in this explosive process of widening than was excavated originally to build the canal. The enormity of contemporary ships contributes to the erosion of the canal's narrow banks as the churning of their giant propellers scour the canal's shallow base, dislodging silt. More than 500 men labor 365 days a year in a constant dredging operation to remove two and a half million cubic yards of soil each year. The sludge is pumped inland to drain and dry but the Panamanian weather often sabotages that effort. At nine degrees above the equator, the tropical sun bakes a thin crust on the surface of the soil, keeping the thick glutinous soup protected underneath, unable to drain. During the rainy season, water collects in the cracks and becomes a breeding ground for disease-carrying mosquitoes. These crusts must routinely be broken for drainage. 
but the weight of men and equipment would easily crack the surface and cause them to be sucked into the slime. The solution is called explosive ditching, a process in which men race across the pits to deposit dynamite charges, then blast away channels in the crust to allow standing water to drain back into the canal. The results are immediate. Blasts are monitored with special high-speed cameras so the shock waves from the explosions can be measured from a safe distance and studied. As in the original construction of the canal, a massive full-time crew of more than 8,000 people are constantly blasting, digging, and dredging to maintain the canal. A project like the Panama Canal can no longer be built. In fact, it would be mind-boggling to assume that that project could get through all the environmental hurdles that are necessary in order to have a project like that proposed, circulated, and built to, uh, to completion. When Teddy Roosevelt bullied the Panama Canal into existence, he didn't have to contend with the legal challenges which would today prevent the first shovel from ever breaking Earth. In that sense, the canal is the last hurrah for the kind of ambitious project which would dare to change the shape of the world. Yet the waterway has found a permanent place in the imagination of man. Over half a million ships have made the nine-hour voyage from sea to sea over the continental divide spanned by the Panama Canal. The operation is funded by tolls for using the locks, ranging from $142,000 for majestic cruise ships to 38 cents for one daring man who swam the distance. But the real value of the canal cannot be measured in dollars. The Panama Canal is a working monument to man's nature, at times stubborn and harsh, but always longing for greatness and cradled in bittersweet glory. As we pass through the canal during the day, we get to a spot which uh, is the deepest cut. It's called the Gallard Cut. And that was uh, the scene of the, the biggest digging and, and of course, the biggest uh, casualties while they were digging through. And as we go through, there's a big plaque on the side of the hill to commemorate all the lives that were lost during the construction. The thousands of workers who sacrificed their lives when this narrow sliver of land was wrenched from nature were also building connections between men and creating a door which would lead the world into the 20th century. It is the most important part of my education. I learned things there that cannot be written, some that you can't learn from textbooks and no one can teach you. You must participate and observe and working with people. I wish now I had stayed, but uh, that's another story. <laughs>